Hello, and welcome to a Bon Mott's production of Masterpiece Theatre, where we review critically acclaimed cinema spanning the breadth of human filmmaking. Masterpiece Theatre. Spoilers, mature content, inappropriate language. Join us. Masterpiece Theatre. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Masterpiece Theater. Today, we are discussing The Wizard of Oz, a personal favorite of mine. I'm Leah Bahar. I will be your host for this evening. Ian? Hello, everyone. That's Ian Manzer, and... I'm Scott Thurlow, of course, as ever and as always, and The Wizard of Oz is not one of my favorite movies, (laughs) so we'll discuss that in a second. I say for this one, we shall go around and each give our own description, and Scott's... Since you don't like it, I will put you on the spot. All right. So I I came up with a number of them, but to keep it clear and concise, naive country girl Bumpkin has David Lynchian dream, realizes herself somehow, and then the movie ends. Nice. I have country gal learns the importance of good footwear by destabilizing foreign nations. (laughs) That's really good. (laughs) And country Bumpkin gets a concussion and realizes that she should give up on all her dreams to stay at home at the farm. Yeah. Mm. So we definitely agree to the country bumpkin. <laughs> All right, well, let's just get right into it. Ian, for you, the initial hook, that opening scene, where does it leave you? I'm really torn on this because, again, I this I have a history with this movie. I, I mm-hmm. saw it when I was a little kid. I grew up with this. But do I like it narratively? It's okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talk about pregnant pause. <laughs> I, I don't know how to rate this because... Again, I, I know everything going in on this. Does it establish Dorothy's character? It establishes well, that she has a incredible attachment to well, her quickly, dog. Uh, that's not quite the question. The question is, does initial hook get you? Yeah, but it's about the introduction of narratively about. The sure. Okay, go on. Do I initially identify with Dorothy? No. And so, I, again, I'm very torn on this. I, I'm going to pass for now and let you right. guys mm. convince me one way or the other. Fair enough. All right. So here's the thing. I've seen this movie a number of times and not often in the greatest of lights and certainly not this time either. I thought in in my own mind, this is the first time I've seen it in a number of years, even having said the number of times I've seen it. In my mind, the tornado happens in the first five minutes. And in actuality, there's like 20 minutes of like her dicking around on the farm, like, doing nothing, like, being ridiculous, like, falling into the pigsty, etc. And I'm like, oh, man, I know the tornado is coming. Like you said, like, we know, everyone knows culturally pretty much what's happening in this movie. But when you actually sit down and watch it, the first 20 minutes are, like, complete padding. So I'm going to give it a zero because it didn't quite get me. It In my mind, I was, I was going to give it a one initially because a tornado sucking up your house is sort of an effective opening. But that doesn't happen until like 20, 25 minutes into the film of nothing, of like her being like annoying on the farm for like a while. So that's basically what I have to say about it. Mm-hmm. I have to disagree completely. And for me, the opening is even before everything starts, but there's that opening credit and it said it appeals to the hearts of those who are you know, young at heart sure. and whimsical. And to be fair, I've never been young at heart. So. <laughs> That's going to be the problem here, discussing the entire movie, of course, but go on. Exactly. If you're young at heart, my argument does not apply to you. But that's what it is for me. It's a reminder that, like, yes, there's all this other political and meaning behind everything. But at the end of the day, it's just a fun story about an adventure, about a little girl that goes on an adventure. And it's I a guess whimsical being, dream, sure, yeah. I suppose. But. And, like, I guess being a small female, I've always really identified with Dorothy. I'm like, totally. Fair I want to get, like, swept away and brought to another, like... Swept mm-hmm. away, but via tornado or, you know, metaphorically? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Go on, though. Depends I'm, on the day. <laughs> I'm, think, I'm trying to think of this narratively. And the characters you're interested in, Dorothy, who's the main character, and Toto, who may be more of the main character. <laughs> They're equal. It's Furiosa yeah. and Mad Max. Mm. If, the, as a plug for that one. Go ahead. Yes. You have the introduction to all three of her companions Mm -hmm. initially and her relationship with them to begin with. You have the introduction to the Wicked Witch of the West. Mm -hmm. You have the introduction to Oz. Mm -hmm. So all of the major players in the story are given context. Are set up. Oh, very much so. So for that, that is an effect. 
effective narrative opening, even if I'm not particularly uh, in, like entranced by it. That's perfectly so fine. So I'm going to have to give it a one, a soft one <laughs> for that. All right. Well, then I'll turn over to Scott for the tonal consistency of the film. In this case, I will have to like again. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. It's the whole point of our mod system. I have to give it a one. Was it? Yes, it was whimsically consistent throughout. That's the whole point. There, there are musical numbers, and every time I meet a new party member, like I like to view it in terms of video games. Of course, that's uh, sort of where we, our origins are. You pick up. It's a FF story <laughs> essentially. <laughs> You pick up more party members, and every time you pick one up, they sing a little song about what their problem is and what you need to do to solve it. So that's all fine. I can't say it was totally inconsistent, mm. so therefore, I'll give it a one. Sure, it, it is what it is, and for what it is, it, it knows what it's doing and keeps it consistent throughout. I have to agree with that. I think, right. It's just this fun, even the way that the bookends work of the black and white and yes. going back to Kansas and keeping that sort of... And that's all fine. Yeah. yeah. Perfectly fine. I, in fact, that sort of... Uh, while this this has become a, an issue, sort of, issue in quotes when we do Mots, that that's, that's the uh, artifact of the film nature of it. Is it narratively? Mm. Like... Yes, I would say narratively it does because it gives her a character arc. You see where yes, she no, starts no. off... Of course the- I agree with that. I'm just saying, like, like it's hard to applied our scale to the shots of the movie mm. but that is an effective thing where it opens in black and white then when she goes through the you know the quote unreality it becomes very visually stimulating and realized in color and then when she returns to quote unquote reality mm-hmm. it goes back to black and white and yes that's effective so I agree with you like that's fine it's just that it's hard to like apply you know a qu- the right. question we're an- answering but I mean it more not just in the way it's shot just the the fact that you have it's something it's bookended by it's that it's bookended yes. right and you can see her character arc sure. and how each of those is portrayed and I think that's even really great that you can take her you can take Dorothy through this whole journey and the arc continues it's and the way full the circle characters, and yes. that's fine yeah so that's all I gotta say go ahead again I'm torn but not because of my viewing now but my viewing as a child. I couldn't actually sit through this movie as a child, I'll admit this, because I was terrified of The Wizard of Oz. And Fair enough. If I... If, as a, and this is aimed at children. If it goes to the point of scaring me to the point of not wanting to watch this... I'm talking about a little kid here. Mm. Is it... Totally consistent. Totally to mm. the point of what they want it to be. I... Uh, I one of you mentioned earlier that there were scenes cut from the witch. Which is, yeah, because yes. she was too scary. Right. And I think of what came later. That's part of our background with, research, by the way. Yeah, yeah. That, that's um, the same. Yes, go on. With the second Oz movie that came out, which was very weird and mm-hmm. very like, terrible. It was way more like avant garde, sort of, mm-hmm. than this one is. But now, uh, again, like, I, should I view this? towards when I was the audience right. it was aimed mm. at it's hard to cut I up your mindset if you believe yeah. sure but even to that point is isn't there something beautiful about watching this story and you have to look through your fingers like you kind of don't want to see it because you're kind of scared but you kind of want to see what's going on and I feel like that's part of the tone of it that's part of the whimsical fear but in the same sense I'm going to have fun with my terrors kind of idea I, I've given my Maybe. my Good. kind of uh, fears with giving this a one but overall it does keep that sense of saccharine sweet whimsy mm. like I said begrudgingly you can't say it doesn't so no. so I again I'm going yep. to have to give it another Everyone. soft one here okay okay and that brings us on to genre and addressing themes um I'm going to be biased because this is one of my favorite genre of films I love this type of starting out in reality what genre is it musical no, no, I don't even know. That's why I'm, I'm. That's why I wanted to ask you this. I don't know if there's a name for it, but I would definitely, <laughs> I would definitely argue that it, it does. It has ex- a genre, it, sure, but which one is it? Well, here's what it is. I don't know the name of it, but it, there's definitely this pattern in films: Alice in Wonderland, Barry Munchausen, hmm. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Labyrinth, where they all start off all in right. some sort of reality. I agree with that. And then, right, and then you come back to it at the end, having learned whatever lesson, etc. So it's an allegory, more or less. 
Broadly. Maybe. Maybe it's like an allegory genre, right? And then kind of aimed at that child in you that mm. wants to believe and wants to kind of say, yes, like the world is cynical and the world is hard sometimes. Magical realism. Mm. Perhaps. I love that. Yeah. Right. And like when you kind of get rid of that realism, what do you... What do you see when you strip with it the, of yes, that, what's left? Yeah, okay. Exactly. And I think this does it really, really well. In the fact that you know the characters at the beginning, you see the three of them, you see the wizard, they're repeated, and then it kind of brings you back at the end, and that's what you want from it. Ian? So, initially I wanted to go off on the socioeconomic and political <laughs> aspect. You still have your chance later, but do yeah, it now but if you want. I don't think that's fair to this film, hmm. because that wasn't the intent. The original story is theorized to be a concept of, like, uh, the, the initial slippers weren't ruby, they were silver. There was a discussion of, like, silver-backed money versus gold-backed money, industrialism, mm. like, yes. agricultural, yeah. all that nonsense. This stripped whatever intent whatever that co- initial social story context had, had yeah it was gone yeah true it's gone and it's just surfaced there so i can't look at it through and as much as i would like to say that she destabilized the ruling <laughs> of the munchkin land and That's more they wanted to elevate, <laughs> elevate her to a level of the monarch to replace the witch but then she leaves thus the lollipop guild will start suicide bombing <laughs> and regardless of all of that sure oh, okay. <laughs> regardless of all that facetiousness what it comes down to is in this movie Dorothy is reflecting on her associations with her home mm-hmm. sure and specifically with three farmhands which is kind of weird I, 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 don't I remember weird. them that weird? Yeah. I remember them being her relatives Mm. Only one is. No, none of them are. Uncle Henry. The, no, the farmhands, though. But the, the he's farm not the farmhand. The yet. three farmhands that okay. she... Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. That's true. None of them are. Right. I think that's just a mistake you make as a child. It's like, you yes. don't understand what a farmhand is. You see people in the house. Oh, they're family. Yeah, yeah but I, I totally can see where I got that concept from. But from the fact that... And it's her dealing with each of their negative qualities. One of them is... Or oh, their shortcomings, of, at, at mm-hmm. least. Yeah. Yes. One of them is a, like, kind of buffoon. Mm. One of them is all business and callous. And one of them is brave in his own right, but has... Like, again, I don't even think they really establish him being much of a coward at the Mm-mm. beginning. Because he does risk running into a pig uh, side to... Yeah, it, it, and even his introduction as the cowardly lion, I felt, was very rushed as well. But do... What was the point of them resolving that? And specifically, I mean, maybe we'll discuss this more towards the end, but I don't feel that their character arcs make much sense to the greater context of the story. What was the point of this film as a message? Was it, like, I can maybe see Dorothy's growth of well, that's don't somewhat, run away from home. That somewhat falls into the next question, as you said, but mm. Mm, it, it wavers on the border. So. so I don't think it necessarily maybe addresses the themes of Dorothy, but all of the supporting the characters of don't have, I feel, a resolution to them. So for if we're going to view it as mm-hmm. in the simplest basis of that, I have to give this a zero. I more or less agree with that. I'm probably going to give it a zero too. Like, but it's I'm somewhat torn about it. Does it address its genre? Like, if the genre is to be whimsical musical numbers, then that happens a lot, and it, it informs the plot. Like, the musical numbers sort of explain the plot yes. in lieu of dialogue. But is there a greater narrative to it? Right. Well, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's a perfectly valid question, and I'm trying to like reconcile with myself what I just said to answer that very question. I don't know if if there is, like. What themes does it address? Like the theme of as we go, you know, our whimsical opening summaries sort of touch upon that, but is it effective dress, addressing them? I'm not sure about that. So like I have to like this question now becomes two questions: Was it effective within this genre? I would say yes. To answer that question, it is. Did it address its themes well? I don't fucking know because like, <laughs> I don't know what fucking themes are really supposed to be other than a whimsical like story. So right. having said that then I think I'm going to lean maybe a softer zero, but nevertheless a zero, because I don't know what the themes really are. It addresses some things. It has messages in it, but they're all like over the place sort of 
to me, like, there was never one message that's absolutely clear, other than believe in yourself, I guess, which is ev- yeah. just told everybody. That's what I'm saying. It's it's hard. But no, what's wrong with? But it's not just the me- the fact that they have a general message. That may be yourself. like you know what? It's it's not a bad message. It's the message. The thing is that they try to add How these other messages yes. in there. What and other message? Every other plot line and all this, all the B plot lines that there are in the thing, kind of fall flat. Not really, because it's. I feel like it's all that identity and being who you are and, be, and finding your true self. Even the wizard has to yes. do that. The witch is kind of. I agree with both of you to an extent. So let me. Uh, I'll finish. Up, I'll wrap up my diatribe about not even diatribe, but you know my thoughts yes. on this. Mm-hmm. It's that it's sort of both in one at the same time. You know what? I'll give it a zero for this question, but. I'll just preempt my answer. The next question, I'll probably give it a one because of that. All right. So, therefore, I'll, I'll be done speaking about this until it gets back to me. <laughs> well, Ian, as this is your choice to start, let's see if you can change Scott's mind. So, the end really confused me because I enjoy the ending because I enjoy the character of the Wizard of Oz. I like Even the Even though you were scared a, of him? <laughs> well, not, not that he's not the wizard. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I was like five at the time. Thank you. Um... But his con man mentality mm. is very humorous to me. Well, he's based on a fucking con man, like the mm. con man in real life, if you will. Oh, like no, the team. Uh, yes. That's absolutely true. But from the very fact that, again, it, it, it implies that I don't want to, I'm really trying not to bring the kind of socio political of the original into this because I know it's not that. But yes. you have the s- scarecrow who they say, oh, you have a brain. The only reason you don't have a brain is because you don't have a degree. And that kind of irks me because that's something that... That is social really commentary, in- mm-hmm. whether or not they... What yeah. extent they intended it, yes. Yeah. yes. But, like, should we require you getting a piece of paper to prove your intelligence? That you, quote, have a brain. Yeah. You yes. Should you have to do a philanthropic activity in order to prove you have a heart? Yeah, right. Should you have to go to war to prove you have courage? And are these the messages this is trying to say? Because that's really pretty heavy satire. And cynical I, also, yes. Yeah, if, I, if they intended that But that's way. the thing. I feel that they took a work that had all that satire in it and stripped it of all its depth. But they had to condense it or they had to like, you know, sur- surface it, if you will, yes. But sure. no, 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 yeah, and, and it loses any impact that it intended to have. Sure, because Somewhat. of that. Somewhat. Oh, maybe if you can service something but still get to the heart of the original and still have elements in which you can pick out and debate. But but this isn't this isn't a interpretation I came up with on my own. This I is an interpretation that. that came from research on the original. Mm. Sure. So I did not pick up, up on any of those themes initially and maybe mm. that's a fault of my own. But I don't you. see a lot of people discussing this as heavy social satire. This is it's us as a whimsical Thing so, w- what is the message? Is it whimsical? Is it satire? And because the, uh, and this uh, is something uh, just real quick. We've said something like this in earlier casts when we we discussed the question. If you have to question yourself upon it, then it naturally leans toward a zero. I would think. And we somewhat said the that. ending made me cringe with how. I guess this is a product of the time. I understand that, but it was so like modulin mm-hmm. and like oh like you were there and you like ah. it just <laughs> yes. it, it, it made me twitchy so f- specifically for that last scene <laughs> of her waking up yeah. again I'm not a, I'm never was never I was always 80 years old so uh, mm-hmm. I was never young at heart so I'm <laughs> sure. going to give it a old grouchy zero <laughs> a curmudgeonly zero yes because I gave it a zero to the previous question I will in fact give it a one to if it achieved its goals by the end, if the goal of the if the goal slash message of the movie was to have a whimsical trip down and impart a moral lesson, that moral lesson being perhaps you can get number of them out of it, but regardless, it's probably the same. So because I get you know, like I said, it's it's sort of paradoxical what I'm saying. Yes, I get, I understand that, but at the end of the day, their message is in fact like believe in yourself essentially. And you you will succeed, mm. so that's fine. Like if, if that indeed is at least one of the surface messages they're going for, that in fact does the movie imparts that. So I'll give it a one for that. There may be others you can get out of it that may be just as effective, but that's the one I think that they intended at least. Mm. So therefore, reluctantly, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll give it a one. Good. Oh. 
I'm going to also go for a one. And I think this is an interesting question because this is a movie that most of us probably saw when we were children and didn't maybe pick out all of the depth and sure, the social that's true. parts that you're, you know, Brian Brink. And you're like, yay, but, believe in yourself. But it's as you saw and you got older, go on. Yeah, yeah exactly. As you yeah. get older, it kind of, that can start to change. And that message grows and maybe you start to pick out more of the political things and why are they running through poppies and we're like, oh, drugs, ha yeah. I'm a teenager. That's a clear and reference, like, yeah. sure. But... And, I, and I think that's it's nice that it depends where you are in your life and what age you watch it that the goals might change for you. That's very true. But at the true. end of the day, it's still, whatever age it is, I still like it, feel it achieves it for that stage. That's fair enough. I, I'm, I'll pretty much agree with that. Goody. I will agree with that, but again, I feel that if I'm looking at it strictly through a narrative, and especially an adult kind of narrative, and maybe that's not fair mm. to how to do it, it is well, kind it of obfuscates its message. I also oh. somewhat agree with that. But, I mean, it's, it's clear enough the message they're going for. And they make it, you know, they spell it out for you more or less easily enough. So, therefore, like, did it achieve its goals? Yes. They, it, it was pretty clear the message they're going for. So if you're unclear about it, you have to give it a zero. But if it's clear enough, more clear than not, then, Deadly. like I said, reluctantly, a one. Fair enough. So we talked you into our opinion? No. Uh, <laughs> I rarely change my opinion. He's still a uh, curmudgeon either way. All right. Let's go Kids. on. <laughs> Whipper snappers as someone says in the movie. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on to the antagonist. And this is to you, Scott. What would you think? Dorothy Toto? Who is the antagonist? Uh, well, the... <laughs> I'll sort of unfold this answer into uh, another character question that we'll get to soon enough. The monkeys are an awesome antagonist. <laughs> the flying monkeys, like that that image to me is like the one that stuck with me the most having like, when I first saw it as a kid. Like it's such a famous thing. It's been parodied and so forth and so many other things. But for a reason, because at least when you're young, they're still in effect they're pretty scary. Like flying blue monkeys are like mm-hmm. bizarre and all they do is like they're efficient. They capture everybody, they they fly them all away. And yes, of course, the Wicked Witch is supposed to be the main antagonist. And she sort of, actually, she also is going to be affected. She is, mm-hmm. in fact. She shows up, she throws fireballs at them and insults and is like, I'm going to get you, etc. Like, mm-hmm. She's a scary, intimidating figure. Yeah. Yes, as a kid. And like, if not now, then like, it's still, st- you know, it's a sign of the times. That's mm-hmm. what they're going for. But she's, she's a mustache trolling villain, essentially. Yeah. But, but a very well done one. And even her character goes back to the beginning when there, she's taking Toto and there's that line, it's like, you know, you may own half the county, but you don't know us. So yes. again, it's the person sure. with the she, money and the based, power. Yeah. And, she's yeah. based on the, the, the old curmudgeonly noble blue blood that is like trying to like, you know, stamp mm. down the, uh, the blue collar farmer workers, essentially, <laughs> just because she can, just because she's annoyed by their dog. Yeah. So, you know, given all that, having said all that, I'll have to give it, again, a one. Uh, Scott, what was that Christmas movie I mentioned earlier? That reminded me of... Angels with Dirty Wings? No. <laughs> oh. Um, the one with it's Jimmy a Wonderful Stewart. Life. It's a Wonderful Life, yes. It reminds me a lot of one. It's a Wonderful Life. The reason I'm going to give this a one is because she still has the sheriff's warning to take Toto away at the end. <laughs> That's never resolved. <laughs> so theoretically, well, I'll remember that up still later, going but yes. to... But you're absolutely right. Yeah. And so nothing was particularly achieved except for Dorothy accepting her fate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. And that's an effective and depressing antagonist. So I'm going to have to totally give... <laughs> maybe not the Wicked Witch of the West, but the real-life basis for You're her. Basically, yeah, we're still... Real, yeah. real, if I may say quickly, the, uh, the shadow of the stranger is lingering upon us because <laughs> you have to accept your fate, whatever it may be. The fate elected for you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that will bring us to main characters. Uh, I will start this off. I love the characters of this movie. Plain and simple. I get a kick out of the scarecrow and the tin man and the cowardly lion and all dancing in a row, singing to each other. I think they each have their own point of view and their own point to say about human nature and what do you Sure, well, they represent with. something about it. Yeah, yes. exactly. And I think, like... Again, no matter where you are and what age you watch, though, you can see it through different eyes. Are you Dorothy? Do you want to be the cowardly? Like, where are you? And even even with the evil witches, like, maybe she's not so bad. You know, she's just <laughs> hanging out. This dog is yapping away, biting at her. Maybe. Yeah. So I like I like that the characters give you different perspectives of human nature, and for that, I will give it a one. Well, if we're dealing with just the protagonist, and going back to your identification, uh, identifying with the character, 
This time around, I totally identified with the great and powerful Oz. <laughs> um, I wish I could be as much of a charlatan as he is. So the question is, do are the cowardly lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man protagonists? Yes. Or yes. are they supporting characters? They're both at once. Because mm-hmm. I would argue that Dorothy is the sole protagonist of this. I see your point, but go on, and when it gets back to me, I'll But this is going to really affect my score. Fair enough. Because mm. I don't think Dorothy... Girl, I, in fact, I think she regresses as an individual through mm. the course of this story. Maybe it's old school morality, mm. but mm. instead of trying to, like, I know, she's running away from home. That's that's a faulty, immature thing to do. Yes. But from the idea of giving up on her dreams of a better life to stay at home where her home was all along on this dusty farmhouse with her aunt and uncle. The godforsaken plains of Kansas. Mm. Yes. Tomato I, Alley, apparently. I, I've been to Kansas. I, I don't <laughs> want to damn anyone to that. <laughs> Fair enough. But, so if she's the sole protagonist, then I would have to give it a zero. However, I do like the characterization. But again, I brought up earlier that I don't feel any of these characters really go through an arc. Mm. I don't know. I feel as though they all start off believing that there's something wrong with them, that I don't have this thing. And yes, it's the wizard who tells them they do. But over time, you see them naturally doing that on themselves. Yeah, but they they, they never didn't have that. And they only get confidence after either from action, which they had in them all along, Mm -hmm. or from the wizard giving them some kind of validation through... A symbolic validation. A validation. And is that a good goal to have? Is that a good arc? So good arc or not, it's still there. I'm going to say, for the sake of ending this quickly, mm. that all of them are protagonists. Uh, so, and because I enjoy their characters, although I don't know necessarily think they're narratively strong, I'm going to give it one. Fair enough. So I'll I'll say something that um, I brought up when we were upon viewing it just earlier, and I'll say it here now. There, it's Final Fantasy like in that. Dorothy, you you start off basically playing Dorothy. If this is a fucking RPG, mm. Dorothy would be your your main character. But then you quickly meet and recruit party members who quickly become also main characters. So yes, like they're like for a very brief period they're secondary characters. But then at the end they're at the end of the day they're main characters. Mm-hmm. So having said all that, so Dorothy and and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion and even Toto are all equally main characters. Therefore, uh, again, reluctantly have to give it a one because they do have arcs, even if it's not the arc you want. They do have, yes. But uh, I'm actually going to go back Their arc this. may be like, you know, if, it, if it's a graph, it might not be like a bell curve. It'd be like a perfectly flat line where they started with something, didn't think they had it, but they still had it all along. Regardless, it doesn't matter because the film, you follow their story throughout the whole fucking film. I'm not, and they have all equal screen time. I was time. going to change my view, but I'm not going to. Okay. I'm going to give the reason why I almost changed it. Because all of this is a fantasy, and you see the reality at the beginning and the reality at the end. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they're, most Everything of the characters in between. are based mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. characters she knows. So none of those characters in real life, in quotations, in Kansas, grow at all. Yeah. Yes, true. Only she regresses, as I said before. So in a sense, Does there's... Does she regress? N- I mean... Defend depending this. depending on how you view hope for the future versus choosing to stay in accepting in, your uh, me- mediocre fate 1930s <laughs> Kansas during the uh, Great Depression the Dust Bowl. but I feel like it's almost more like you know she she tries to run away at the end and as we stated she goes back and the whole thing with the dog isn't resolved so staying home means growing up and having to face it instead of running away from the problems which is what she has to do when she's in Oz yeah but we don't see how she re the, the thing is we don't see how she reacts after the fact all we see is her saying oh I'm so glad to be home where I'm safe and sound and don't have to deal with the responsibilities of ruling a nation after I deposed of the so all she wants to do is it it says she started the movie trying to run away and spent the entire rest of the movie trying to run away from Oz (laughs) only to be happy to go home and and never having to face any repercussions for anything she's done and I've just convinced myself there to give it a zero (laughs) fair enough that's all legit I really I can't feel like argue against that. That'd be a great that. reason to give it a one because you have these. You see this. You see this. Oh, you know. What? I just saw that no character. 
literally nothing in this movie mattered <laughs> for anyone fictional <laughs> or otherwise. So, well, that's the nature of a dream. dream. Yeah. <laughs> but I get no, it, but, uh, what you said completely stands on I'm, the surface. I'm, I'm not going to argue against it. I'm going to give you a, an example. Um, the Never Ending Journey. Mm -hmm. You at least see... Never Ending Story, that is? No, no, sorry. Never Ending Story. Where you see the character have to deal with real life situations by what happened in the within fantasy. the dream mm -hmm. fair enough and Dorothy never has to do that that's somewhat that's fair that's true alright well if we've already established Dorothy and the Tin Man as main characters who are the supporting characters and how effective are they okay. uh, again I'm going to go back to my old school thing that I love uh, The Wizard of Oz and I, what, what was it like uh, Professor Marvel or something like that in uh, the Kansas version of himself mm. oh yeah mm -hmm. Which sounds like a Marvel character. Mm -hmm. It does. But go on. If every single character has a real life version of like an you know, XP. Yeah. Or in, an in, analog in, at in least. In Oz. Yeah. What if, if all this happens in her head, mm. what do the Munchkins represent? I'm going to say that same thing mm -hmm. myself, but you go on. And specifically the Machiavellian uh good witch of the north, uh Glinda, Glinda who literally has Dorothy wiped out all her competition, mm. aside from the good witch of the South, supposedly, or whatever. Over so many supposedly, yeah. Yeah. unless she's been uh, taken mm. out by another uh, uh, interloper. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, again, regardless of all of that, Oz and his charlatan uh, is, is Nature fantastic. Of it. <laughs> so I have to give it a one. Just I, I enjoyed every scene he was in. And all his machinations. So. All right, fair enough. Well, I hate the Munchkins just because I hate their songs. <laughs> this, again, uh, yes, I'm biased. This is a musical. Like, yo, know, it's it's a, again a sign of the times. Like, do, do, this was the kind of movie being made. There, how many musicals were made in like the late '30s to '40s? Right, like a lot. So this happened to become one of the most famous ones. Sure, I really hate most of the songs in this film, <sighs> but. I'm going to give it probably one again because of the fucking monkeys. Like <laughs> the best, like they represent like a, sort of like a primal fear almost, and that's fine. And that's going to be effective if I'm taking it to be effective and memorable. Mm -hmm. Then I'll have to give it a one, just based on that. In the same sense that you know, if you love an as our tradition of, if one secondary character is fucking awesome, then that qualifies everything to have a mm -hmm. one. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. in that sense, I'm applying that to this. And that informs Situation. to me because I'm torn between a one and a zero. I love the cast. I love it. My problem is always, where's the aunts and uncles, you know, doppelganger and odds? They're these lost characters. They do show up briefly in a, a dream within a dream, if you remember. Yes, in the mirror, right. But they don't but have... But whose exes are they? Yes, yes exactly. Sure. Who and, are their and characters? Who, and who are the other characters that appear that have no... That don't have an ex. So, yeah, like, yeah, so... Sure. That, I, like, it, imbalance makes me almost say, like... One can go to zero. I'm like, well, where do these people come from? They're supposed to have this root in reality and teach or something. It. But at the same time, the flying monkeys are awesome. Like, to this day, you know? Sure. <laughs> flying monkeys, it's an, it's an enduring image for a reason. Yes, yes. of course. But mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I said, of course, based on the strength of that. It also we... has the most empathetic bureaucrat of all time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's also true. Yes. Ah. Uh, you know, just to be fair to the movie, because I think I've given it once this whole way through, I'll go with a zero. I'll say with the... Just to mix it up a bit. Um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> just for fun. All right, um, so Scott, though, if you don't like the songs, where do you stand on dialogue? This one is probably the one I thought about the most upon mm -hmm. while when we were just watching it. And let me try to condense it. Yes, I hate the songs, but... <laughs> They propel the narrative. <laughs> it's necessary part of it. Mm -hmm. And while it's like basically the, every song that every character sings, w when you recruit your party member, they sing a fucking song to you, and it's the same goddamn melody every time. Just what they want. They, their 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 fucking MacGuffin is different, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Like broadly, it might as well. Their X equals Y equals Z. If I only had all brain, heart, courage, so they're all the same interchangeably thing. There were some lines that were okay, even like <laughs> beyond, you know, up outside of the songs. Mm. So, man, I'll give it again th the most reluctant of motherfucking ones <laughs> because it's it's fine at the end of the day. It's 
all of it is cringeworthy. <laughs> so, you know, that's usually our scale. Like, oh, if something was cringeworthy. But again, because of the nature of this film, because of when it was made and how it was made and, you know, the culture in which it was made, you can't, I can't like blame it. I can't hold it against it. And it propelled the narrative. That's the whole point. Like they were singing, or obviously the wit- every time they have a so new party a member, <laughs> they refrain. Yeah, it is a one. They refrain it back to it. So, yeah, I'll stop talking. I'll stop trying to justify it. I have to give it a one, even though I want to hate this film and don't <laughs> want to. Narratively, it forces it to be given a one. Oh, I will give it a one too. But I just I love the dialogue of this film. The whole "Are you a good witch or a bad witch?" I'm not a witch at all. Witches are ugly and the song Bad witches really... are, It's fucking annoying though, but like, it's, at least, as I said, it propels the plot. So, so yeah. It I... gives you the exposition you want, that you need, if not want, that <laughs> is to say. I don't know. I feel like that line asks such a deep question. Like, are you a good witch or a bad witch? You're this new person. Maybe, but... You're coming to this place. Like, where, where do you stand? Who are you in terms of humanity? Which is a question that's opposed to each of them. Um, even the songs, like, some of them are corny, but I love the way that they rhymed everything. To be and clear, then... they're all fucking corny. But oh. again, they propel the plot, so... Yeah. That's the point of it. Somewhere over the rainbow, and it's exactly where she goes. I'm gonna go to one. So, uh, are you a good witch or a bad witch? I'm not a witch at all. Witches are ugly. Alright. Um, What's your fucking I don't. Answer? I don't hate musicals as much as you do, Scott, I suppose. Or at least this That's one. That's probably true, yes. This is one of the most highly quoted musicals mm. I can think of. Mm. Their memes live long, yeah. if you will, yes. And that speaks to the power of them. Whether you think they're overused nowadays or not, You're right. it's you know still what? true to that point. You're right. And, again, I, uh, you're right. I, if it's cringeworthy, I tend to go to the side of zero. And I mentioned earlier that I felt that some of Dorothy's dialogue was... Because again, I don't, I don't buy into that whole mom pop apple pie uh, <laughs> Americana dialogue. kind of thing. Yeah, sure, but but there are great lines, and again, I think that when you see Professor Marvel mm. in all his glory and all his <laughs> shadiness, mm-hmm. something I never picked on a, a, on as a kid, and I'm not even until, until this. I haven't seen this movie in like ten years or so, but until I watched it this time, it was the first time I picked up on it, and it was fantastic. Like just. Like him picking the picture out of the thing to mm-hmm. uh, yeah. while he comes yes. so that he can comment accurately. He's upon a great con picture. man. Yeah. Oh, it was fantastic, and him not remembering philanthropists, so working around it. You're right about mm-hmm. that. Like sure, his in a sense, even though there were cringeworthy, I have to give it to the benefit of a character who I thought had great dialogue that shone above all this. Fair so enough. I'm going to give it a one for that. Okay. Um, and then that brings up the question of immersion. And does the corny dialogue break it for you? And does it make you want to go for it? I don't know. I'm going to let you boys battle it out for a second first because I'm right. a little torn on this. I don't know if we're going to battle, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to have to give this a very solid zero because I spent the entire time thinking of the political ramifications <laughs> of every action in this movie. Well, that's a, a very extenuating circumstance, but still valid. But again, this is me personally as a reviewer. Yes. I'm sure that 99% of people who are watching this are wa- watching the. Uh, this is where movie. the subjective part of our system well, comes well, in. Think of that. But I, I couldn't help but bringing up like, like the Munchkin people who were ruled by a thing, and then the, that was gone. Oz was ruled by the wizard who came in there. Like these people believe that a man falling from the sky is a, a godly figure, <laughs> yes. so they elevate him, and now he's gone. The I don't know. It just all, all throughout, I just kept thinking of the deeper the unintended consequences yes, of sure. everything that happened in this film and that broke my immersion and as you know I was commenting throughout this film <laughs> so I have to give it a zero <laughs> sure so I, I of course want to give it a zero but here's the thing right if you're if you're going into anything especially something like this a, a work of fiction there's some degree of suspension of disbelief so this one being as ridiculous as like what <laughs> What would you not accept? Like, <laughs> once she gets to Oz, whatever is going to happen, probably you're going to accept because there's no rules anymore. Like, reality has gone out the fucking window anyways. To comment on that, it's the question of whether you buy it initially. All right, no, no. I think I'll rephrase it. Does it play by its own rules? Yes, because it almost has no rules. Like, <laughs> You can crush a witch with a house and then you become the ruler of a nation, but you can also, like, leave that nation and follow the... Mm-hmm. Like, is it, like... It's so like offhand, and like it, 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 it itself does not play by its own rules. 
But that's sort of the whole fucking point. I don't know what would have broken my immersion. Like, <laughs> if a dragon came down and breathed fire and burned all the midgets, you know, that burned the lollipop people, I would have believed that because the <laughs> world is as ridiculous as it is anyways. May I ask you a question? Yes. All right. I can, I can very much tell throughout this film that it was created off of source material. Would you give the same pass to a current movie that came out nowadays mm-hmm. that was as loose with the source material as this one was? Maybe. It's difficult to say. I mean, that's an excellent question. It's a great question. The problem is relativity, of course. Like, because we know the nature of this film, like, you can't make that, you cannot draw that ratio. You cannot draw that comparison one to one. On the surface, to answer a question, no, of course I wouldn't. But because it's so bizarre anyways, on the surface, like, what what would I, like, the line is this. What will you and will you not accept, mm-hmm. given the first things that happens is she walks out of her fucking mm-hmm. house and is surrounded by a bunch of singing midgets, and then a witch comes down and tells her how great she is for murdering another witch. Like, it, that's all Where do you go from there? motherfucking yeah. ridiculous. So, yeah, given that's, a, that's like their setup, what were they, fu- yeah. what could have that... What could have followed that up with that would have made me like question what's happening? Mm-hmm. I meant to bring this up earlier and I forgot completely about it. Go ahead. Bring it up Dorothy now. Dorothy took all that in stride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what She's I'm saying. She's just like, yeah, okay. And well, apparently, not in Kansas yes. anymore. Yeah. We're good. You're supposed to like take that because she's basically like ostensibly she's your audience like POV, like, you know, your audience surrogate. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to have her reactions and why wouldn't you? Like, oh, fuck it. Sure, I believe yeah, whatever. Like, so much doesn't be matter. Like, in Kansas. <laughs> Probably, but I would still be terrified okay. if right. everything I, was no. black and white and turned to color. Okay, <laughs> Maybe, she's, it's not like she knows that. All right, no, no, I got it. I, I'll, I'll, I will finish out my answer, and here's why: if you accept flying monkeys as being awesome, <laughs> as being just a random part of it, then you have to accept everything else. If that doesn't break your fucking immersion, I don't know what fucking will <laughs> in this movie. So therefore, one, no, it, 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 as I said, it could not have been broken because it was all ridiculously on the surface, anyways. Fair enough. Mm. So therefore. That's it. I'm done. I think she takes it in stride, but she does, like, you know, Dorothy walks out and she hears it sneakling and she's kind of, like, turning around and looking every which way. So she does take it in stride, but she does, she's not just like, okay, whatever, this is good. She mo- she, she's more on the side of that. If you were in that situation where you just flew a house through a tornado <laughs> and landed in a bizarre I'll world. be like, I can't believe I'm alive right well, now. You know, yeah, I don't give a shit what's happening. House, she just kind of wakes up. Me, I don't know. I'd kind of be like, well. She was looking out the window watching. Oh, everything go yes. by. Yeah. So, that's true, um, but she does get her head. No, she, she gets knocked down. She gets to sleep because like the no, the window or whatever yeah, hits her. Yeah, yeah. So she does eventually like, wake up in Oz. It's implied to be that like that's like in her own subconscious or whatever, like mm-hmm. her own fever dream. And if you're in your yes, own subconscious, and then like but, nothing would be rational yeah, so, because like, you're in your own subconscious. You're, if you're having a dream, like mm-hmm. let's just on a quick tangent. If you're having a regular dream. Bizarre things are happening to you left and right, but you accept it all on face value because it's a fucking is, dream. This is more yes. of a lucid dream. Though. Yes. Mm. So she's consciously aware Someone, of it. Somewhat, yes. Dream. She has some influence over it, but nevertheless, you're still caught in a dream. You know, it's a mm-hmm. Descartes kind of thing to you know, to, to drop that in there. But, but uh, nevertheless, just, like, I'm just saying, you guys know what I mean. Yes. The listeners, when, when you're having a dream, even if bizarre things are happening, you're still you're in dream world, going through sense. that yes. and experiencing it and sort of accepting it like at face value as it happens. Well, then let me rephrase my okay. zero here. When I was a kid, my immersion was broken because I couldn't finish watching this movie because I was scared. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Now as an adult, it's so ridiculous and it laps itself that mm-hmm. I can't get invested in the movie. Mm-hmm. That's fair. That's okay. perfectly fair. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, then how do you... Stand on recommending it. Was it enjoyable? If your immersion was broken, would you very suggest others watch it? I think it's an important movie to watch. Okay. I think as a kid, it should be something you see. Mm-hmm. You're probably going to see it. <laughs> Regardless. <of the> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. And just for kind of the historical sake of it, it's important to watch. But is it the greatest movie of all time? By no means. Uh, we're going off the AFI 100 list for this series. I wouldn't rank it on my top 100. But nonetheless, I give it a 1 for you should. So. Fair enough. Again, not, not as reluctant as a 1 as I said earlier, but nevertheless, it's going to. It almost has to be because, A, the reason, like, Masterpiece Theater, we're doing the classic movies of all time. This is on the list mm. for a reason. Sure. Is it my favorite, greatest movie ever? No. But should you see it? 
probably because what it means to film, even if it's not narratively the greatest, you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, I don't, I don't mean to say it's a cop-out answer, but because of its cultural impact, mm. I guess, right? Yeah. That's why you should see it. Even if it's not like the greatest film <laughs> ever in the world, of course, mm-hmm. according to me specifically. Nevertheless, yes, I recommend it because of what it means to film, because of how other films that came after it, or even not even just films, Media everything, general, yeah. yes, was influenced by it. So it's significant in that sense. Therefore, yes, did I enjoy it? Not quite, but it doesn't matter. I would recommend it. So I'll go with that. Mm. That'll be why I give it a one. <laughs> I will concur and also give this a one. And not only will I recommend watching it, but I will recommend to watch it throughout your life and let it grow as you grow. At watch intervals? It. It's, yes. Sure. Exactly. Like, enjoy it as a child. And be excited by the poppy fields as an adolescent and engage in oh, the social, political part. I'm excited by poppy part. fields. <laughs> Always. I mean, hell. Go on. They're beautiful flowers. I will give them that. <laughs> you know, and so watch it. Go out and watch it. Show it to your kids. Watch it again and again. And with that, we will bring our evening to a conclusion. Um, Ian, you gave this sad, sad six. A slap in the face to all those who (laughs) Middle finger in the face of Oz. (laughs) Take your fly monkeys, (laughs) shove it. (laughs) Fair enough. Scott, you gave this a lovely eight. So, and I will... More than I thought I would give it. Go on. Ah, the begrudging eight. Mm -hmm. And I gave this a 9, bringing our total to an average of 7.66, so... Repeating. <laughs> of course. Of course. Um, so I guess that means we'll recommend it to you, the I think I think that's about right. Mm. Mm. Especially in the context of today, yes. which may not be fair, but right. it is what it is. We touched upon that. It may not be, but nevertheless, that's how we're I'm viewing it. it, so there it is. Mm-hmm. All right, well, have a good evening, everybody, and look out for flying monkeys on the way home. I am now going to be flown away by a pair of flying <laughs> monkeys. Good night. Right. I'm uh, Jonathan E. Menzer, uh, signing off. And I'm Scott Thurlow. And I'm Lay And I'm melting! <laughs> what a world. We hope you've enjoyed your stay. Masterpiece Theater. Join us again next time, won't you? Masterpiece Theater. Music and editing by Chris Morgan. Masterpiece Theater. Editing and engineering by Stephen Ramosi. 